Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, so this is our final keynote um, for the for the day. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce you to Darren um, Doherty. Um, Darren is a farm planner who's a founder of the Agrarians Limited and Agrarians Platform, which is the world's most comprehensive comprehensive agro agricultural agro ecological landscape enterprise and training framework. Um, since 1993, Darren has worked with many thousands of people around the world and since 2004 has been a key figure in introducing regenerative agriculture to many continents. Together with Andrew Jeeves and Georgie Pavlov, Darren is leading the Regarians Handbook Project. I'm going to now hand over to Darren for his keynote presentation um, called Global Examples of Regenerative Agroecology agro Sorry, I've messed that up again, in Ecosystem Restoration. Um, over to you, Darren, and thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for the uh, for the opportunity to to be with you today and uh, this wonderful uh, conference. It's uh, I mean, it's it, there's so many great uh, pieces going on, I, I, um, and I uh, wanted to congratulate uh, everyone at BioLinks for pulling together in a pretty short period of time such a stellar list of uh, people and uh, and and segments uh, presentations. So everyone's pretty lucky. I'm really glad that it's recorded because I really want to watch all of them myself. So thank you. Um, in my talk, um, I'm going to start with talking about the Regrarians platform, which we've developed over the last decade in response to perhaps the first two decades of our work in uh, farm planning, particularly here in South southeastern Australia, and then uh, more so since 2004 internationally, where we've spent most of our time by the last couple of years. Um, outside of Australia, working on all manner of projects and uh, all across the place. So we've sort of uh, had to develop a platform of our own that really worked and, um, and it was comprehensive enough to, 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 to really deliver on the scope of, of this broad industry, which is called agriculture. And if we take that even further and make it turn into agroecology, then try and pull it all together. So the, the platform that we've developed really helps with that. The platform itself is based uh, or adapted from P.A. Yeoman's framework that he developed in 1958 called the Keyline Scale of Relative Permanence, another Australian. Um, although his framework um, only had eight layers and were real more factors and in planning uh, broad scale, uh, mostly grazing properties. And, and wasn't really holistic because it didn't consider, um, well, humans much. It was more of a, a, a raw farm planning framework. So here we go. So our first layer is the climate layer. Um, as I say, the, the climate between a person's ears is one of the hardest climates to change. And we can uh, rip that large to how we're managing um, this, this planet and this country. Uh, so we always start with our conversation around climate about the climate of people, uh, the climate of who we're dealing with, um, the families that they're working with, the enterprise that they have, the communities that they're a part of, the culture, both prior and current, that, that informs all of that. And then uh, the regulatory climate that uh, really frames what you can and can't do. Um, the risk climate that's about um, emerging and what you're factoring in and predicting. And then also the meteorological climate, which when most people think of this layer, that's what they're, that's what they're considering. Um, the geography layer is the next layer. So I look at the first, these first two layers, the layer of climate and, and geography as being um, really foundational or constitutional layers, we'll often call them. They, they, another way I'd put it is that when we look at all of these different layers, the climate, uh, the climate layer is really setting the rules of the game because it's your rules and your boundaries and what you want to do. And then the rules of society through laws and regulations and the laws of the wet, what the weather will allow us to do. And then there's the, and then there's the, the, the board game, the geography, what the terrain that you're working with, the place and, and what that delivers and what that enables, what it's capable of, and so on. And within that, um, which plays into Dr. Tongwe's uh, uh, discussion this morning, no doubt, was, and what perhaps Graham Hand will talk about this afternoon, is uh, landscape function. And 
how we monitor how we're going. And so we're very much informed by the work of Dr. Tongwei with his landscape function analysis. We've taken that and others uh, learnings from the Savory Institute with their ecosystem outcomes verification protocol and, and a whole host of others. Um, uh, 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 Kirk Gadzia with his bullseye pr pr platform and tried to create ways in which people can monitor how they're going, monitor where you are right now, but then also monitor what, when you're monitoring, have a way that allows you to actually show you what you need to focus on as a manager, but then also show you um, in future, whether you're going forwards or going backwards in particular ways. So that's a really important part of the sort of ecosystem restoration part of what we're, what we're all about. The water layer is another layer and, you know, a big part of that is not so much as it was in the past um, about building dams and, you know, uh, diverting water, but more about us being really clever with the use of water, using pipelines and only having this the amount of storage that we actually need to have as opposed to what we want to have and living within that framework and trying to be as efficient with water as possible. And it's a really good era for doing that. Also consider with water how we're going to mitigate fire um, and how and how we're going to address fire risk to properties and all of its influence. The access layer, so where we put roads, where we put trails, laneways, all of those sorts of things, their impacts on landscapes. Um, roads are a high runoff coefficient uh, uh, points of, of interest in, in a landscape. They can also be something that we can help to harvest some water if we're a bit uh, stretched with gathering it, uh, particularly in areas where we don't have um, existing water infrastructure and storage. The forestry layer for us is really the living systems layer, um, well, the biotic layer. And so when we look at this layer, it's really about how do we integrate flora, fauna, fungi, um, and other forms of, uh, of biota into the whole mix, you know, how do you integrate trees? How do you integrate animals together with trees, the crops that we're growing, the capabilities that we have, but then all of the different layouts that are within that, you know, because there's so many different types of layouts and there's existing layouts that we have to deal with, that we have to live with. So existing riparian forests or block forests that you might have and so on, but then the, the systems that are already being put in and then the opportunities that you have to to go forward and how that's going to look. The buildings layer, which is not just about the set farm buildings that you have or houses or ha households, uh, homesteads, but also this new stuff where we're doing portable buildings. And there's a lot, you know, in the last decade or so in particular, there's been a real push to, to using portable infrastructure as a part of the, the overall uh, more agroecological farming uh, layout. But then also that extends to on-site processing and um, both of livestock and the recycling of the nutrients that, that, that come from that. But then also uh, on-farm forestry uh, where we're using uh, portable sawmills and so on and how that all fits. The fencing layer has changed a lot over the period. Um, uh, you know, the use of electric fencing has allowed us in large part to, to have a greater biomimicry of the of the migratory dense or dense herds of animals that uh, that hurt that uh, that most of the livestock that we husband um, uh, evolved with the landscape to do, and uh, you know we've we've managed them in larger states with uh, basically uh, no no real regard for how they actually have inherently. Uh, integrated in, in, at, at landscape. So electric fencing has been something that's really helped with that. And a lot of our discussion is about um, how do you actually integrate fencing and what style of fencing um, gets integrated where um, and what and then what designs of fencing go in. And also to look at the, the almost lost art of shepherdry and, and the role of natural fencing as well. The soils layer is in large part framed by holistic planned grazing practices in our um, uh, view, um, because we think that that's a really good way of, or a really good framework to help us to plan um, what to do best where and, and when. And uh, it, uh, because it does consider holistically 
where you're at, um, what your enterprise requires, what your landscape is, is needing or crying out for. And if you've got livestock or you're growing crops or whatever, how they fit in with that whole dynamic. And then the agronomy that's necessary um, and all of the, some of the new, new types of agronomy that are, that are coming along and analysis and assays and so on and different treatments that are available. And with that, you know, we're considering as, as this excerpt from the uh, soils chapter of the Regrarian's Handbook would indicate, you know, this, this shift in paradigm from where we've, where we've had this unfortunate 200 year experiment of European colonization in this country and others, which is longer, um, and how we're going to address that and stay here um, and what that's going to look like, what are the methods that are involved and and what's that journey going to be take, uh, working forward? Um, the economy layer is um, really about us rebooting. Um, a lot of people uh, would find in agriculture that the terms of trade are, are not so good now. They're certainly a lot worse than they were perhaps in our parents' or gra grandparents' period of, of land stewardship. And so a lot of our conversation here is about what does that reboot look like? Um, how are we going to correct or take back some of our control so that we can improve our terms of trade. And that leads to us taking on roles that perhaps we haven't been familiar with, like, uh, like getting involved with more of, with other parts of the value chain, whether that's um, the marketing elements or the processing elements or the logistics elements. And what is, what is all that going to mean? I mean, it's a great era now that we see when we go to a field day that so many farmers have got a, their badge on them of where they're from. I mean, if we go back 20 or 30 years ago, um, everyone was relatively anonymous, but there's a great deal of pride around about um, the brand of our place and, uh, and who we are and what that stands for. And a lot of that's coming through. And then finally, uh, the energy layer, which starts with us trying to as best we can, because the biggest engine of e ecosystem restoration is photosynthesis. It, it you know, plants, Plants are what drive this whole thing um, with this relationship with the carbon dioxide in the air, and the nitrogen in the air and, the, um, and, the, and sunlight um, and water. How do we pull all of that together to make it so that it works as, as long as it can? Because you know, a lot of our landscapes have declined where, uh, to a point where a lot of, especially ground story photosynthesis, especially with grasses and other pastoral forb species, only occurs when there's sufficient moisture. And a lot of this landscape has had, um, a, lot of, had a lot of the C4 or grasses diminished. And uh, so how do we get that all back? Um, that's, 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 that's something that's really foundational to this whole story. And that's what I'm going to address in a moment. So, but the other challenges that we have about how we're going to power what we have in the future, you know, what role is the, is the, is the, so what, what sort of solar economy are we going to have? Is it just photovoltaics, um, you know, using rare earths and, and high manufacturing processes? Or are we going to start to look at coppice-based agroforestry, biomass, all of these sorts of things? Um, you know, it's a really wide field as far as understanding what that's going to look like in future. So I've got a few case studies here that I thought might be useful, and you know, not just here in Australia or, um, or in this region, but more broadly, just to give people a bit of an, uh, an understanding of some of the activities that are happening on different scales and in, di on, on, in different parts of the world. So Glen Alpine Station uh, run by the O'Sullivans is a 23,000 hectare um, uh, station, uh, about 40 kilometres inland from Bowen in North Queensland. You can see the stats there, averages 700 millimetres of rainfall between 126 and 467 metres in elevation. Um, and the, the temperatures are between uh, 16 and 30 um, in terms of means. This particular station is classic to so many of, uh, of that part of the world. And it's interesting when you read, I read the Australian Beef Report a couple of years ago, and it made it really clear that the top um, the, the, sorry, the lowest 20% uh, percentile producers in the northern zone of this country as beef producers are more, um, have, have more viable businesses than the top 20% of the southern zone producers. 
And in large part, that's because of the scale of their operations, because you can, you can effectively even run down a property and still make money. And I know that not, it's not a diss, but I know that because I work a lot in that part of the world. And it's, um, it's astounding how, um, how poor the management can be. And yet still people can make a really um, decent living. And it's largely because of the scale of the, of the operations. And there's a lot of people up there who are very concerned uh, as producers about how their landscape's going, and um, which is fantastic. And the, and the O'Sullivans are one such uh, couple and family. So that one of the first things that they looked at doing, as so many people do, is focus on the, what we would say, focus on the water and the, and the fencing layer. When you've got a live livestock, um, you know, having really, you know, as you can see here, paddocks which are in the thousands of hectares, it really goes back to when this country was managed um, by squatters with you know really large um, or areas, but without but without the shepherds. And um, so, so it's any wonder that you get this sort of bare earth outcome with occasional bits of green, according to uh, flushes of, of good weather. So that's one of the first things that will often be a focus is, you know, how do we plumb the system? Because we can do that relatively economically now with the agency of plastic pipe and really cool plumbing uh, uh, pump systems and so on, but then increase the fencing. And the fencing in this case is even over this grander scale is, is electric. So using really lightweight fencing, which you will find at home on 50 acre properties as well. So that sort of infrastructure can shrink and swell over, over the, you know, right up to the broader scale enterprises. The big thing that they did here was to bunch their animals and use a system that will use, part of their grazing plan was to use a technique which is called ultra high density grazing, which was developed by a few people, Roger Savory, the son of the famous Alan Savory and Johan Zeitzman, both the Zimbabwean graziers. And the concept here is basically to have a really high uh, density of animals, which then, uh, if, they're, if they're not eating what, what's available, they trample and they manure and urinate, urinate in a really um, tight, dense spot. That's all facilitated by portable or uh, lightweight fit fencing infrastructure, and in this case, portable watering infrastructure for a herd of three to 5,000 head of animals. An experiment that was done a few years ago um, in conjunction with NQ Dry Tropics and NRM that I work a lot with um, was to get all of these heifers and bring them in of a night and, uh, and, 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 and or younger animals and uh, bring them in and corral them in an area as part of an erosion trial. Those animals would come in and overnight and they would basically chip the ground with their feet. So create a disturbance regime which and and a fertility dump. And they did that over four or five nights. And then as a result of that, it changed the, it changed the fertility of that landscape significantly, but it didn't do it to the point where it became a weedscape. So where you get stock camps, where animals day after day after day sit under a yellow box tree or a great, whatever the tree is and manure there and you just get a flush of thistles or heliotrope or whatever the heck else it is. This, this was timed such that the actual response was a whole bunch of uh, C3 uh, perennial grasses, bunch grasses. And the outcomes of that were pretty profound. It went from a landscape that was eroding and degrading and actively so to one that uh, shifted completely in the other direction. And some really good evidence there in terms of when we look at the indicators of infiltration rates and, and the saturation of the profile and to what depth and, and so on, it was a really, really strong outcome, um, both visually and otherwise. And that's continued to be. They um, have ceased doing the ultra high density now because they looked at that as being an initial uh, high input step because it had a high input of labor. They were moving their animals multiple times a day and so on. And when you've got 5,000 animals, that's a, that's a lot of, a lot to take care of and water infrastructure and so on. So they've eased back because they've gone through that step of the first step from where we've got degradation to restoration. And now they're going and, and continuing on with, with uh, regeneration. 
So this is another project. Uh, this is a mining project, which is interesting um, because, you know, in central Victoria, at least, we have a lot of mining projects which um, where different kinds of ecological restoration practices have been put in place, mostly around planting of trees and shrubs. So this is a, in, a, in a fairly high altitude landscape, 2,338 metres above sea level, about 200 kilometres from the coast. So similar distance, but a lot higher than uh, what we'd have here in central Victoria. Um, and uh, this is a, a gold tin mine um, owned by a large Canadian-based conglomerate. Um, and they did a really good job with their cleanup. They stockpiled as much of the topsoil as they could and you know, followed the regulations as best they could. But one of the things that they innovated with was using livestock again. Um, you'll see, and I've obviously got a theme here, um, using the tools that are available. I mean, we, this part of the world, um, as many others are, uh, uh, use livestock. So, um, so in this case, they invested in what's a program of what's called bale grazing. And so that's where basically you're using the messy habits of livestock, um, feeding open bales of hay, and then letting them do kind of like a broad acre form of no dig gardening, um, where those animals uh, trample on that landscape. And then you can see, when I said topsoil, not much, and uh, because that's the soil condition, as you can see on the right, and the power of manure and cover, it doesn't take very much organic matter cover or residue cover on a landscape to get things going. And you'll often see that after, after we have some sort of rainfall event and you'll get the little debris lines and then you come back a month or so later and those debris lines are like these little patches where, some, where something is where some plant is taking the opportunity and away it goes. And that's gone on um, where, so they've continued to do that as a, as a project. And more recently, um, which is really profound because they found that the cost benefit, because they'd actually started to look at this as a cattle grazing enterprise, that the cost benefit because of the cost of hay was such that they decided to actually shift over to growing chickens on uh, pastured chickens on this site, which is a really astounding set of circumstances that you wouldn't uh, necessarily predict um, for what was a, a really large mining site. Um, another project, this is one that we've worked with for uh, the last two years. So Benjamin is a Frenchman who moved to work down on a on a project in Somaliland. So Somaliland is the former, is a part of, unofficial part of Somalia, um, used to be known as British Somalia. And uh, his project is about 1300 meters above sea level, about 200, uh, about 100 kilometers from the, the coast of, uh, of the Gulf of Aden um, on the Horn of Africa. Pretty hostile environment, hot semi-arid. So probably similar to um, inner parts of Queensland close to, you know, especially down in, you know, as we get to the west of the Channel Country, that sort of thing, but a lot more distant um, from, the, from the ocean, of course, there. But those, you know, we're always looking for sort of analogues, I suppose, as far as landscape. So this landscape is, like so many parts of this world, um, grazed. Um, you know, you have nomadic grazers and with, with, the ownership of property as has happened over the last 150 years. You've got a lot of small properties which are sort of in the 30 to 50 hectares. Now, in this sort of landscape, that's not going to, you know, you have to have a very low cost of living to be able to eke out a living on, off those acres. So a lot of these landscapes get um, uh, communally grazed. So they've almost treated like um, common lands. So one of the first recommendations I had for, for Benjamin was to fence, create a perimeter fence so that at least within the confines of this project, um, we could get some management and then look at developing some base water infrastructure. So you can see in the bottom photo there, there's a little section, I can't use the mouse here, but there's a little section, actually I can, can I? I think I can if I go here. No. Anyway, there's a little, there's a little well there. And so we connected up some pipe work and got a bit of water infrastructure across. And with that, the other thing that we did, because they've got hyenas and lions and all sorts of stuff there that want to eat the livestock. So 
one of the things that we did was built the, and we could, couldn't get electric fencing and all that sort of stuff from, from our part of the world. So we, so we recommend building these portable uh, sheep corrals and, um, and, you know, and so on. And the, into those go chickens and that sort of, because these are the animals that they have. And with that, um, we've gone from having a predominantly um, woody shrub landscape with a lot of bare soil um, to after having the first rains um, where we did uh, really high density grazing, as you can see, that's pretty high density where you put those animals in there for a, a, for a day or so. Um, there's non-selective grazing and a lot of trampling of material that's not consumed. So you get an immediate soil cover. And in the areas which were a bit more open, such as, uh, as you can see in April 21 slide there, um, they, they were completely desolate. So one of the things that happened, and this was just off 150 millimetres of rain in that season, was this immediate burst of what are a range of perennial grasses, which people had not seen in living memory. So this seed bank that had been sitting there waiting for the, the right germination conditions just emerged and it was pretty profound and has continued to be. Now, lastly, because I don't have a lot of time, is coming back home is one, a pro project that I've been working on since 2009 um, when I first met uh, Belinda and Jason Hagen. And this is out at Tubrak um, here in central Victoria on Tungurong country. Now, um, it's... Um, any of you listening would know where Tubarak is. It's near Heathcote and Seymour and Puckapunyal, uh, Pyalong, a really nice part of the world. And uh, right at the top of the, of the divide as you go through there where it's uh, high granites, um, or relatively high granites for this part of the world at least. So 319 to 404 high, um, it's about 140 kilometres from the ocean, um, obviously closer to the bay. Um, um, I just use that as a point of reference um, and the property size is 200 hectares. So the property, when I first came in, well, when we, they both uh, weren't living in, they didn't move back here until 2009. It was Jason's family property. And up to then it was really all, almost a hobby farm of, uh, as it had been for a long time. The Hagens are quite a well-known fa family in that district and they, um, so Jason had been working away and Belinda had been working uh, away. They, they were both um, working in the pig industry. Um, uh, uh, Jason working at, uh, down in the Otways um, on free range systems and uh, Belinda in the feed industry as an animal nutritionist. Anyway, they've got married and come back here, wanted to start a family. The property was divided in half when we um, came, when we started to work together. So they had the left hand side of this of this image of the image, the two thousand and nine image. One of the things we did was started to work on this. What you know, they wanted to they love pigs. They're pig people, and we wanted they wanted to turn this place into a, a pig, uh, into a pig paradise, um, following a sort of a method which we'll call pastured pig production. Anyway, come forward to today and they're really, um, we should be very proud to have Belinda and Jason in this region because I, I often say that they're the, the best pastured pig producers in the world. And I don't say that lightly because I have many people around the world that I've seen and worked with who, uh, who would do a really great job, but these guys just take it to a whole other level. Part of that's what we've done is embraced this philosophy of trying to minimize the damage that pigs would otherwise do so by having a really high management centered approach where pigs are moved um, very frequently so that we don't get any more than about 15 to 20 percent ground cover loss so that means you've got to have the water and the fencing infrastructure to support that um, and and the trees and the layout. You'll notice with the, some of the fencing infrastructure here, if you can see that adequately, that it's all following a sort of a contour alignment. Well, that's that's by intention. We're trying to have it so that we keep as much water in the landscape and as much nutrient in the landscape as possible. This farm imports about 600 tonnes, metric tonnes of food a year to feed the pigs. To, to supplement their feed. So that's a lot of nutrient that is added to this landscape. So we've got to have a, a landscape that really can take that and can use it in its rotation. 
So we consider heavily in this um, some of uh, what Peter Andrews, uh, the well-known uh, land planner and his natural sequence farming uh, approach is, and that is to try and have it so that the areas right at the top of the landscape are really conserved and have a different level of protection and land use as water and nutrient recharge zones. And then the main agricultural zone is where we have most of the agricultural production. And then in the areas where we've got these beautiful valleys, um, which you can see are outside of the use of in agriculture, the McIver Creek um, and the various uh, uh, primary valley strips that we have going, that we keep the animals out of there. And they're apart from uh, the occasional graze of some sheep and cattle, which are much less impact on those landscapes than say the pigs would be. And that's really helping us along. So one of the things, whoops, one of the things that we're doing um, is, or have done and continue to do is to try and mop up the nutrients and try and accelerate the succession back towards something that's really unexpected as an outcome. And so that, that outcome is a whole range of recruitment of perennial native grasses, both C3s, the winter active or uh, cool season, perennials, but also the, uh, the warm season perennials, which are emerging all over the property. And that's a really unpredicted outcome that we had. And uh, as I've talked to Sophie a few weeks ago, when we look at the recruitment of perennial grasses in the winter rainfall zone, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge which takes some time. And I don't really have uh, a methodology that, uh, that really cracks that code. Um, this is just one example. And we're using cover crops. Um, we're using the key line plough, which uh, with modifications to that so that we can sow cover crops at the same time as doing um, a deep subsoiling and that sort of thing. And that's, that's been something that we've done a lot of, helping mopping up the, uh, help mop up the nutrients of the pigs, but also to create an opportunity for the recruitment of, of, new, of new species above and beyond the ones that we've planted. And it's uh, proved to be a really, really positive um, step forward. So this plowing and sowing at the same time and that, that succession of effects, um, well, we at least think that some of the plowing effects may well mimic um, some, of the, uh, the, some, some of the work some of um, that, that uh, the bioturbation, that work that marsupials in the environment once would have done. Um, we don't, unfortunately, a lot of those uh, mammals, are ex marsupials are now extinct, which is a horrible thing to have happened because there's so many species which have co-evolved with them that, are, that also themselves are finding a hard time to actually exist. And so there's, it's a really complex set of circumstances that we find ourselves navigating as we try and move forward and try and claw back um, some, of the, some of the ills of land management that unfortunately have been inflicted on this continent and everywhere that humans have habitated and practiced agriculture. So we've had a really good time with that. And that's been a really positive thing where we've got these animals in different rotations, trying to make a living because trying to make a living on a landscape uh, that's a 200, try, trying to make a living off a 200 hectare landscape in central Victoria is not easy unless you do horticulture and then you've got to have water and very special soils. And, that, and Jason and Belinda have been able to do a wonderful job with that. Um, they produce over 3,500 pigs a year and sell them mostly to local markets, which helps them to address those terms of trade. So thanks for all of that. Um, I, I just, um, I had some other images there that I just wanted to share on Jason Belinda's, which didn't quite make it before we get to questions. Um, didn't make, I was just processing these on Google Earth today. And um, uh, it was, to, we've been doing a range of drone flights over this property uh, since, uh, with, since the enactment of the planning for sustainable animal industries uh, reforms here in Victoria, which require um, us to have no less than 50% ground cover on these, on these landscapes. And so we felt it was a good idea to uh, monitor this. And the best way to monitor it, what, what we felt was by doing it from the air. 
So we've been doing a range of NDVI um, based images using a, a using a drone. So every few months, um, um, Jason's been flying over the drone on the same flight path at the same elevation. And the red is really the areas which are of low photosynthetic activity. So when we look at areas like in these valleys, for example, um, this valley is largely filled with rank tussock grass. So not a lot of photo visible photosynthetic activity. So it's the areas in between where it's fenced. So this area was pretty heavily um, dealt with by the pigs as we transitioned over from that area being um, a road. Um, we converted a road, you can see an old road through there into uh, a paddock as we changed the layout. Um, and over time, it's just got, uh, depending on the time of year, it's got greener and greener and the areas of red have got less and less. Uh, March 2020, so obviously at the end of summer, um, we've got some heavier grazed areas up here, which have been where they've been doing sows and, uh, and through to today. So it's been a really good journey to see um, even from the sky, these changes that have been occurring over time. And that's what I have for you. So thank you. Um, I think uh, you can stop sharing your screen now, Darren. Okay. And then, yeah, so we'll jump into some questions from yep. the audience. Perfect. Yep. So I saw a few come through. Um, yep. couple, couple from four. Paul, couple from John. Um, why don't we start with John's first question? He asks, wondering how you decided on the recharge zones. Was that conceptual or based on some data? Mm, it's, yeah, great question. It's most of what we do um, is... Well, if you look at the data, the farmer's data, um, a farmer or a land manager, well, I'll come back a moment. Our method of, of farm planning is highly participatory. So we actually put people through a year long program in which we deliver, which, in which we help them to develop their own farm plans. And with that, within that is questions for them to ask about to ask their landscape. Um, now, some people will go in and they've never, it's a new property. They don't have any, They've never had anything to do with it, and so we'll have to spend a bit more time on with them to help them understand that landscape. But then others will have been there for decades uh, or however long, and we'll get well because they've been there for that long. Their observations should help us to understand. Uh, what are the recharge areas and which are the discharge areas and so on to help inform that. If there is data available, well then, great. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the time it's not. And so we have to use uh, topographic maps, which are becoming much more available. Um, we also use drone and NDVI Im imagery because that's really helpful in us um, being able to, to define those through the analysis of vegetation. Um, and so on. So, yeah, there's a bit of both, but it's mostly based on if you call observational data or observational uh, observations conceptual, then that's probably where we sit. Great, thank you. Um, and do you or the land manager, whoever it is, uh, monitor nutrient movement off the property via runoff and into the groundwater? You do? Um, no, not necessarily. Okay. Um, no, because um, one of the things that we're, we've moved towards, which is uh, like, I, like I alluded to earlier, um, uh, we work a lot with the Savory Institute and we've worked in with the development of what's, uh, what's called their land to market program. And the basis to certification or verification within the land to market program is what's called an ecological outcomes verification protocol. And so that's, I suppose that's in response to um, the fact that most um, producers don't necessarily have um, the scientific apparatus or instruments to go and do the kind of um, measurement of um, ecosystem outcomes or performance that perhaps government departments or others might have. And so for us, it's, it's perhaps more practical and pragmatic, therefore, to look at, well, let's, 
let's do the monitoring based on the vegetative outcomes that we can see and where possible like if there's a stream running through or we've got a piezometer in place or some, something else or we want to put that in place that's going to help allow us to do off-site uh, lab analysis on these things, then great. But as a lot of people would appreciate as land managers, you see a lot of these responses through plant community development. I mean, when you see a plant community emerge that wasn't there before, well, then it's the role of the manager in large part to ask why. And typically, if they're on the ball and if they're looking and observing, monitoring, then they can usually point the finger directly back at themselves and some sort of management that they, some, some form of management that has led to that outcome. And so that's really the way that um, we sort of frame this. But, you know, I would love, I, I also work with people like Abe Collins um, at Landstream in the US. I'm the vice president of that company. And we, you know, Abe has developed sensed landscape. So he's got sensors everywhere, which, which like physical sensors, as well as using remote sensing um, to, to physically measure all of these on, in a real time, all of these uh, indicators in, in real time. But, you know, that's a super expensive thing that farmers aren't getting paid to do. I mean, they, but they're getting paid bugger all as it is. And so for them to be able to go and do all of the monitoring that we would love for them to do is just in large part not, not possible, not feasible. Okay, great. Um, another question um, from Barry mm -hmm. who asks, what should we do with Indigenous perennials? Will the cover crop negatively affect them going forward? Yeah, um, we've seen both. Uh, like I look at cover cropping as being a uh, interim step towards um, helping the recruit. Well, that's how it seems to be. You know, I, there's no, and Graham Hand will pro possibly talk about this this afternoon. I mean, Gra one of Graham's great uh, contributions, I think, is this, uh, uh, this concept of safe to fail trials um, where you do things on a safe to fail scale and that failure is not necessarily like a lot of people would say, oh, I'm going to do some cover crops. Um, and well, you have to understand then why am I doing the cover crops? Am I doing it to mop up excess nutrients? Um, because when I do my nutrient budgeting, which is, you know, all of that is pretty well understood. Um, if I do my nutrient budgeting and I, then I need something to mop that up, so to speak, um, through that act. That's, that's an agronomic question. But then the other question is, what influence is this having on existing plant communities or is, it, is my purpose also to direct plant communities in a particular direction um, by, this, by this influence? And so one needs to, I think one needs to start with asking those questions. And now, if I had a really great um, patch of microlina or a really great patch of, of Themida kangaroo grass or something like that. Um, and I've seen this um, with people like Jason and others. Well, then part of the holistic grazing planning process is that you always look at a landscape and ask the questions of its current state and then what influence your management is going to have potentially on changing that state. So if I've got indigenous, if I've got really high integrity um, indigenous perennial grasses, for example, um, well, then it's very unlikely that I would uh, I, either A, have the pigs on there if it was that kind of property, or B, use cover crops because we've already got to where we want to go as far as high landscape function and ecological function. I mean, we can't do much better than that. So it's really, you know, picking and choosing which tools of management you are going to use um, on particular landscapes. And further to that point, Liam's asked the question which relates to exotic grasses versus indigenous grasses. Mm -hmm. um, is it worthwhile removing those exotic grasses or back to your point about assessing the landscape in general yeah. and what's already there versus what should be there? And yeah, how would you respond to that? Um, thanks, Liam. Uh, look, I'm, I'm um, as I said, as I intimated in the call, uh, in, in the presentation, it's, it's 
uh, when Sophie and I first talked um, and others have talked for a long time about how do we get the recruitment of more perennial grasses into these winter rainfall, the southern zone um, or winter dominant rainfall zones um, is a real challenge. Um, when we look at the historical record of uh, this part of the world, it's really clear that the perennial native grass base that was here when, when, um, when the First Nations people were, uh, were, were the primary managers, um, that it took very little time at, uh, of, from, from the switch to European management and set stocking by hooved livestock for those grasses and plant communities to just disappear altogether. And like in some places, it was a five to 10 year um, disappearance period, right? Now, if you go to central New South Wales, you know, pretty well anywhere from Dubbo North, um, right up through that part of the Riverina, if you like, the Murray-Darling Basin, where the change goes over the summer rainfall, those landscapes have been belted by, by the same landscape management practices, but yet it, those perennial grass bases up there still exist. So there's a, there's a clear relationship between the uh, rainfall patterns and the temperatures, but the rainfall patterns um, and, and, their, and, and their responses to basically the same kinds of management. So when we're looking at the question of, can we just go and swap things out? I don't think it's that simple. Um, we've still, we're still trying to work out um, this great challenge of how we can return to having or how we can get landscapes to return to the kinds of um, uh, grasslands and, and pasture species that we once had. So I don't think we can really just say, oh, yeah, we're going to just get rid of the exotics and then the Indigenous ones will just come back. It's not that simple. It's, um, I, and I really don't have the answer for that at this stage. Um, yep. But, um, yeah. It seems to me a big part of that, though, is carbon. Um, that if we can get more carbon into the into the soils, well, then that um, that will help us to move things along. Darren, just in relation to your um, your framework, your ten points that you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned water infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, dams, and mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know diversion and the various kinds. I was just sort of more thinking about the the broader sort of concept of rain use efficiency mm -hmm. about infiltration of soil of rainfall into the soil and trying to maximize infiltration and, and use of that water on site and, and yep. reducing the leakiness which which we've talked about earlier in this symposium today so reducing the leak uh, the, the the leakiness it, well is that <laughs> well if we're if we're infiltrating um as much as we could well then um that's probably increasing the leakiness in a way i don't know how that no, no, yeah, yeah. no the, the leaky if you if, if you go back and look at some of the earlier presentations the leakiness is in which i haven't to, had the opportunity to do yeah, so yeah it's yeah, it's yeah. in reference to runoff right and overland flow uh, clearly right. all water that falls in the landscape eventually moves from that landscape yep. it's just the yep. rate yep. at which it does so that yep. that's yep. the definition yep. gotcha, of gotcha. Leakiness. right sorry i wasn't aware of that yeah, no, well, I mean, I've got, uh, I mean, I could show a slide that we use in our water presentation, for example, which, I'll, which I will bring up because I think it's really, in, uh, it, it paints this picture. Um, just bear with me for two shakes. Um, we uh, always focus and our primary focus on the water layer is on addressing uh, ground cover. Um, and because when we get ground cover, the first thing that a raindrop will do, the first option it has is to infiltrate. That's that's just a that's just what we do. Um, because you know, I'll look at my own career. Uh, I've built a lot of dams. Um, I grew up on a uh, on a very heavily dammed landscape uh, outside of Bendigo, um, and I uh, yeah I've built a lot of dams. And in large part, in the first part of my career, really, I think that that was just culturally what we did as farm planners. When you have a farm and you don't have enough water, you build dams, right? And I, as I started to wake up to myself, I suppose, and wake up to um, how things work a bit better, I think, um, I shifted to much more to having a, 
well, as you would put it, a, a much a, a, a landscape that uh, absorb that is much more absorbent of all the water that comes through it, as opposed to it just um, uh, being one where all flows are diverted, um, and that the whole landscape wasn't uh, uh, wasn't um, treated that in that way. So, I mean, this is this is one of our slides that we have uh, in our water presentation. So what I start with is looking at what is the anatomy of a raindrop, how much water and soil, because I look at this as, as a volume question. You know, most people don't realise that one millimetre of rain on one square metre is one litre and, um, and so on. And most people understand the power of what's going on in this uh, high-speed photograph, that the highest particles as we break up here are organic matter um, and then the smaller part, next level particles and so on. So you get this, this mixture of materials. And then what happens is you get a separation of that when it lands and you get all of the, uh, the kind of leakiness that we're, that we're talking about and high levels of runoff on landscapes such as we have here in central Victoria in particular and elsewhere, which just really can't cope with that level of flow over them. Um, so, yeah, we're definitely on that. I mean, this is a project I worked on, on, on in Hawaii on one of the islands there on Lanai um, with, with the last remaining Indigenous people on there. And they, they're just watching their land bleed away from all of this rainfall from really bad management. So, no, I don't, I don't, the way I look at dam, the whole dam story now is it's an antidote to, well, we live in, we have sedentary landscapes um, and sedentary systems, which, uh, which sorry, I'll just stop sharing the screen, do I? Have I done that? I think I have. Um, we have these sedentary systems which need water. We're not necessarily um, blessed in this country like we are in the US or other places with really good quality groundwater. Um, so and springs and all the other things that we find all over the all over the planet. So we have to get our water from somewhere. Um, the role that I the way I put it now is let's start with how much you fundamentally need, and then everything above that we don't know. So we found ourselves pushing dams in on a, uh, on places because just like what's happened in the Wimmera um, when they piped the Wimmera. What that meant was 96% of the water that wasn't available is now available. And we find the same on farms now. And also, Paul, I'd add to that, I did a project in Western Australia a few years ago. I was invited over there because land managers have been practicing holistic planned grazing for over a decade. And they found that that practice and the um, changing rainfall patterns had resulted in so much more infiltration that they uh, weren't, and the change in rainfall patterns was such that they weren't getting the runoff that they once were. And so we had, so we built some, some roads into that landscape and decreased the sum number of, of dams that we had because we started to use a piped distribution system. So yeah, uh, my, my view on this has changed a lot in the, you know, say the second half of my 30 year career in this place, in this space to be very much, I think, aligned with, with, uh, with what you're putting forward. Okay, uh, I think we have quite time for just one more question. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do Bert's question. Bert, do you wanna um, jump on and ask your question directly? Otherwise I can ask it. Uh, sure. Um, Hi Bert. What did I ask? <laughs> Hi, yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. No worries, thank you. Um, yeah, just, just interested in how biodiversity or particularly canopy species and native veg, what, what, sort, of a, what sort of a priority or what sort of um, a strategy is embedded in the system um, or, or is there one um, that, well, that, that tries to either maximise or, or, or optimise that just from a biodiversity point of view or, or does it just intrinsically have less of a priority because you're focused more on, on, you know, the production side of it? Yeah, great question. I, um, to be crude um, or reductionist, I would say that when we do an assessment or work with people to assess their, the state of their, 
uh, whole farm landscape and all of the existing systems, often that will come out to being areas that are, say, and this is the crude part, to be in or out of, of agricultural production. So because obviously we have a lot of native vegetation clearance controls um, and red, uh, uh, regulation around that, and, and even when you park that to one side, I mean, I promote um, a form of agroecological planning which places a really high importance on um, on landscapes of, of of well on on existing um, communities of vegetation which have um, uh, values which don't necessarily fit with the uh, with the type of production that people have you know and, and when we look at it most people in this country and others are either grazing or they're growing a crop an annual crop or they're doing both and if you've got an existing uh, forest or you know, canopy cover, then then those two uses are uh, those two production uses are largely incongruous. Um, if you were to go and put livestock into that landscape, well, there's probably they're going to be hungry really quickly. So there's not much value you putting them in there in the first place. We may sometimes use livestock in those occasions um, as a pulse. Uh, to help with fire suppression, for example, um, if other options are not available to us in understory biomass management, but that's that's pretty rare. Um, and it would require, I mean, I would only do that if um, I had uh, an understory which, um, which, which was largely uh, not Indigenous, for example. So it's, it's you know... A lot of these questions is you'd appreciate, but um, take a bit more than a five minute answer or, and you know, they, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're a two sure. and pro, but, and you know, you need to look at each circumstance individually, but we really, we spend a lot of time with people um, trying to have them understand what they have and the values of what they, what's there. Um, and then see what sort of um, strategies are appropriate um, for taking us forward. Just to go right up to the top, when we look at the climate layer, one of the first things that we do is to have people define what they want out of life and what they want out of their relationship with their landscape as, as a part of the holist, what's called the holistic context formation. And we've done literally thousands of those with people all over the world. And I would say, I haven't done the index, but I would say that over 90% of those people who put themselves through that process as land managers mention biodiversity as being something that's important to them. And, and not, not, just in, not, just be, not just saying, oh yeah, I like biodiversity, like actually embedding it as part of their statement of purpose, saying, all right, and then what does that mean? That means well, if there's existing biodiversity of different kinds, then I'm going to do what I can to not only uh, protect that, but also to enhance it, if that, if that at all helps. So it's a really big part of the frame of how we lead, our, lead people through this journey. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank, thank sure. you for your Look, question. Yeah, sorry, sorry, thanks very much. Thank no, you. Thank Thanks for your question, Bert. All right, well, unfortunately, we need to move on. We do have our workshop um, starting now. So um, thank you so much again, Darren, for your keynote and for your time uh, answering awesome. everyone's questions. Um, yeah, we'll leave it there. And I hope to see the rest of you at the workshop in a few moments. Thank you.